We're really glad to welcome you here tonight and glad to welcome Tom Swearinger. I hear something special when a horse hoof hits the ground. There's nothing else as magic as the rhythm of that sound. Could be a gentle clip-clop ambling down the street or thunder at the gallop all a blur of legs and feet. Doesn't matter whether barefoot or shod with nails and steel. There's nothing else I've heard it gives me quite the feel. I've heard the greatest orchestras and the diva's glorious song. Choirs harmonizing like a grand angelic throng. I have seen the late and great ones, from Elvis to George Jones. Those with voices that move and shake you deep into your bones. But I hear something special when a horse hook hits the ground. There's nothing else as magic as the rhythm of that sound. I've heard a child's first words in the whinny of a newborn foal, the beautiful songs of yesteryear, classic poems of old, the echoes through the canyons when a coyote calls a friend, the gentle sound of evening breeze and daylight's peaceful wind. And yes, those sounds are wonderful, and each speaks to my soul, but so does the sound of hoof beats. And horses are on the roll. When I hear a horse's hoof beat, no telling what I'll find, with imagination running free, painting pictures in my mind. A future derby winner leading on the rail. A Pony Express rider rushing someone's mail. A finals barrel racer turning on a dime. The old country doctor's buggy arriving just in time. Desperado's getaway, following a spree, posse hot behind, aiming to hang him in a tree. A bred to buck saddle bronc, flanked and just set loose. Proud Umatilla on a swift coyote. A bulldogger and hazer closing on a steer. The revolution warning ride of patriot Paul Revere. Or the horses I grew up with when I was just a pup, flicking, silver, trigger, <laughs> and my stick horse, Gideon. <laughs> no telling where they'll take me when I hear a horse's feet, my imagination in the saddle just a riding with the beat, because I hear something special when a horse hook hits the ground. There is nothing else as magic as the rhythm of that sound. Thank you. thank you, thank you very, very, very much. And we are so appreciative that you're here. I know some of you all know me, and, and I appreciate that. You still showed up. <laughs> and, uh, and I also know there are some fresh faces in here, and, um, and I appreciate your, just your support of live music. And, and in this case, spoken word, and to come to a place like Artichoke. What a great treasure we have in this community to have Artichoke. Yeah. So I am Tom Swearingen. Got an N on the end of that name, Swearingen. <laughs> and uh, my wife, Carla, and I are uh, really, really uh, blessed to uh, have made a life. We live here in Oregon, and we've been blessed to make a life that includes horses. And. Uh, we spend, and I spend, a whole lot more time with uh, our horses than I do other people's cows. <laughs> so with that in mind, and tongue firmly in cheek, I don't call myself a cowboy. Well, I have friends that say contraire. They say, but Tom, you own horses and you love to ride, and we'll just look at the clothes you wear. Yeah, I've got Stetsons and Resistalls and boots a bunch of pair and a closet full of snappy shirts and wranglers that I wear. Well, I know the label in these jeans says they're cowboy cut. <laughs> on me? That just means to get them on, I gotta suck my gut. <laughs> yes, I've heard what the cowgirls say about wrangler butts. 
but it's only in my dreams that I've ever drove nuts. <laughs> no, I say calling me a cowboy just because of what I wear would be like calling you Lady Gaga if you put tinfoil in your hand. <laughs> the name's a compliment I cherish, but it's going a bit too far because just knowing where they shop don't make me half the man they are. For to me, cowboy is a name that ought best be reserved for those fitting the job description, for those that are most deserved. Me? I've never owned a cow or hired on to herd. So calling me a cowboy is just a bit absurd. I've never ridden night guard, never helped a cow and cow, I've never doctored up a sickly calf. Not sure that I'd know how. I have rarely worked a branded they're eating cookies, Chuck, and I have never settled in a rough stock shoe and said, boys, let her buck. <laughs> Closest I've come to wrestling with a steer is flipping a big old T-bone while sipping a frosty beer. <laughs> but I have learned some from vaqueros. I have rode with buckaroos. I've ridden with the wagons for weeks up in the blues. I'm at home up in my saddle and I know my horse is mine. I can guide it with the gentlest touch or just the shift of my behind. And I've got to admit that the loop I throw is better than just fair. I am dang near deadly accurate when roping a patio chair. <laughs> and I write some cowboy poetry. And I like reciting my written verse. Those who hear it don't seem to mind. It could be much worse. I think mostly folks are just thankful I'm not singing cowboy song. Because if you've heard me try to sing, well, you know that that's just wrong. And while I don't give myself the moniker, I understand why some folks do. So if you want to call me cowboy, I'll leave that up to you. And if you do, I'll consider it an honor to be counted in that crew. I'll just smile and tip my hat and imagine I'm Chris Ledoux. <laughs> well, I'm pretty confident there's some folks in this room who know the name Chris Ledoux. Yeah. And, the, and the rest of you just clapped because it rhymed. Good and, for you. And that works, and that works too. You look up Chris Ledoux for the next on the end. Wonderful Grammy nominated, uh, late, great Chris Ledoux world champion uh, rodeo cowboy, uh, Grammy nominated singer. And uh, great memory of Chris Ledoux's impact on us. So I really am okay with being called a cowboy. You know, I, uh, I have cowboy, and I cowboy on occasion, and I'm sure I'll cowboy again. When I, when I do, it's helping friends, really. It's just, it's just dumb to, to go help friends. I have never uh, made a living or tried to make a living as a cowboy. I've never put cowboy on my tax return as I'm paying. You know? But I really am okay with being called, called a cowboy. And those, those uh, experiences uh, have been wonderful. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to take you, actually. Let's go. I want you to picture early morning, uh, real early. Uh, Barely light. Saddled the horses in the dark. Got some breakfast, and then I'll back out. And the sun is just now showing, and we're horseback. There's not a lot that's spoken as we sit upon our mounts. The cow boss checking tallies adding up the remnant counts. He's mighty long on wisdom, but pretty short on words. When lining out the circles when we're gathering up the herds. They're out there, boys. Go get them. You know what to do. And of course, he's right. He should know. He handpicked all the crew. He knows there'll be no slack and that we'll more than earn our pay. And since that's about all that matters, he's not got much more to say. So with just some simple point and some nods among the boys, we head in all directions, taking in the morning noise. Now you'd think without us talking, there'd be nothing much to hear. But actually, in the silence, there's a lot to hit your ear. Like birds awake and sing, cicadas flicking wings. The aspen trees are quaking and there's bubbling in the springs. 
Muffled hooves on dew-drop grass. The snap of sun-parched brush. Thermals blow on up steep slopes. And bob whites whistles before they flush. And then the sound we come for. Faint, distant from below. Ballin' calves and mamas tell us just where we should go. The silence gives direction, sometimes better than what's plain. And so we leave the talking to the language of the land. Thank you very much. I'm curious how many how many people tonight are hearing Cowboy Poetry for the very first time? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And uh, so you'll be able to go home tonight or tomorrow to your neighborhood, your uh, co-workers, your family, your friends, people you run circles with, and you'll say, Gosh, last night at Captain Garden Show, I heard the greatest Cowboy Poet I've ever heard. <laughs> Tom Swartzen, that's his name. He's the greatest one I've ever heard, I'm telling you. And if you would do that, I'd, I'd sure appreciate it. That would be good. That would be good. So, uh, I'll take you out on another little adventure. My, uh, my wife and I had an opportunity talking about helping friends. Anybody ever been to Diamond, Oregon? Yes. Have you? Yes. You drive into Diamond on far, far south, the east uh, corner of uh, Oregon. Drive into Diamond, it says population five. <laughs> and I asked that question once, and some woman said, Yeah, I used to live there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking the sign used to say population six, because I don't think anybody's ever moved in. It. Just, the, the number keeps getting small. And so he needed some help. And, and they, are, they, they ran 600 uh, mama calf pairs, and they were out grazing uh, up onto the edge of the, of the Steens Mountain Wilderness area. <clears throat> on a piece of ground 25 miles long and three canyons wide. And there were, oh, I don't know, what was it, Carla? There were five dozen of them out there that had not come down as they should have, in the seasonal change or whatever, and so we, we went up to find them. And uh, we spent a week uh, looking for them. But it was very cool, very, very cool, just camping and looking and, and finding them all. We're working out a cow camp up at Cucamonga Creek on a late summer gather for now, going on a week. My wife and I are helping a friend named Tim O'Crowley. He and his wife Susan run the cattle in this valley. Each day some different work to do, maybe ailing cows to tend, of course rounding up the strays, and there's a fence or two, man. Diamond Valley lies before us on spectacular display, a big old slice of heaven on a bright September day. Southeast Oregon, high desert, where the kiders still run free among the sage and paintbrush and the quaking aspen tree. Looking southward up the canyon, miles of rim rock wall our right. To our left, windswept mesas, not another soul in sight. Steen's Mountain in near distance just flat takes our breath away. The beauty on the summer range makes work feel more like play. More than once, I've heard Tim share a thought that I too know is true. Cowboying's a whole lot easier when it comes with a great view. <laughs> Before I go on, I'll just give you an idea how we're gonna do this night. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do about a half an hour. I'm halfway through about a half an hour. And then I'm going to introduce my friends to you, the notable exceptions, and they're going to do a half an hour. That'll take us to an intermission. And then if you come back, we're just going to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure we got their money, girls. <laughs> uh, whatever. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you come back, after purchasing CDs from each of us, you come back. Uh, we're going to... We're going to take you up to 9 o'clock, just going back and forth, poem, song, poem, song, poem, song, poem, song, poem, song, poem, song. So, anyway, so, so, the poems I've just been sharing <coughs> spoke about the, uh, is, really, inspiration comes from the land. And the land has been a great inspiration to me. And so, too, have people that have come into my life. And uh, this, uh, 
this uh, this poem is to, with one of those people in mind, and uh, and usually when I do it, people tell me later it made them think about or they had an opportunity to think about people in their lives that they appreciated that might have inspired you or whatever. So even though I'm right, I'm telling you about a particular individual, it might conjure up a, an idea people have been important in their life. That cowboy on the cane horse, pretty darn good party. He's been there, seen it, done it. Through times both good and hard. He's been at it for some time, a good long stretch of years, rounding up calves and mamas and turning balls to steer. He's worked in some big outfits, been bossing one or two, taught a lot of other hands a bunch of what he knew. Taught us what it means to be a worthy friend and hand, about love and work and honor and how to treat the land. He told us, don't just do a job, you give it all you got. You only go around one time. Life's with your best shot. He showed us the importance of keeping our word true. That if you make a promise, do what you say you'll do. We've watched him facing hardship with determination. and No matter the outcome, show appreciation for those that stand by you, that come along his side, ride with you through the humps, and cheer you through the ride. One to ride the river with. That's his reputation. The kind you can't depend on in that situation. I've had the good fortune of knowing some good men. The kind you can look up to and hope to see again. Not just for their achievements, although they're worth remark, but for how they live their lives, how they give a spark, kindling those around them to glow and grow and give. Make the world a better place. Show us how to live. I ask you, Lord, for more friends like the one thought of now. Give me more just like them, Lord, and please, if you'll allow, a lot more years for my friend so he can show us more what it means to live with grace before the other shore. So I mentioned opportunity to cowboy here and there, and, and uh, most of that has happened in uh, most of that has happened in Oregon. So I will take you. Uh, this is parts of Oregon. This is just a few. This is just a few lines for Oregon from a grateful native son. I have roamed all corners of this state at lope or trot or walking gait from vantage point of horses back on vast wide range and single track. Smell the air of sage scent mesas. Followed ruts and ancient traces of nomads, beasts, and those who came to stake their claim and bring my name. Watched desert devils spin and dance, their dust trails haze the far expanse, and then fade and lift and leave behind my outlook clear with inspired mind. Cut the tracks of wild Mustang bands, packed deep and cool at timber stands. Spent enough time around city walls to know I prefer Kyle's calls. Circled herds on high grazed grasses, trailed them down steep switchback passes. Spent many nights with stars my lamp bedded in a remote camp. Big way across rivers snaking down from mountain range and hilltop crown. Seeing life they bring to valley floor and then fresh the salt at ocean shore. I've come to love this diverse land where creative fires can be fanned. Six decades here have made it clear I'm glad my roots were planted here. Oregon is a sacred ground where coiled up thoughts can be unwound and then strung in lines to then be sung with passion, voice, and angel's tongue. So now my plan is for me to stay until my final earthly day. And if that works out, then I'll be blessed to ride my days out in the West. <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you very, very much. I have a friend who uh, manages a ranch in Central Oregon. And, uh, well, that's right. I brought this thing, didn't I? Stand back.
<laughs> you guys know what this is? Yeah. What is it? Larry. A Larry? Yeah, Larry. And, and, and what am I? Cowboy. Cowboy. I'm a poet. <laughs> So you're what are you looking at? You're looking at a Trouble. you're looking at a poet Larry. I'm looking at I'm gonna say you're looking at a poet Larry. Yeah. yeah. So I do have this friend. He manages a ranch in Central Oregon. Yeah, his name's Teddy Frank, and he posted on the internet a while back a picture of his hand with a horrible rope burn down the middle of his hand. And uh, his Facebook post said, note to self. <laughs> Three dallies around an oak tree ain't near enough to stop a <laughs> runaway hogs. Next time I'll be in a saddle when I toss my twine. And I thought, there's a poem there and I'm gonna write. So I just made this up. Teddy Frank of the Morrow Ranch was out mending fence alone when coming to his attention was a charging wild eyed run. Closing fast, that big, spooked, crazed mare was running for all she's worth. Her nostrils flared, her ears pinned flat, a cyclone of hooves in her. The mere sight of that hellbent hoss would leave most men quite rattled. Especially if, like Teddy was, surprised on foot, unsettled. Yeah, most men would duck, dive, or run, but not Teddy, no siree. He conjured himself up a plan he'd not let that wild mare flee. A Teddy recall was all alone. Most people would say out man. But not those who know Teddy Frank, because he had one tough hand. Surveying the situation, he figures his only hope would be one chance when she went by. He'd collect her with his rope. He'd toss a big old floating loop that would sail out over her ears. She'd know right quick she was vested. <coughs> Let go her primal fears. Oh, she'd settle down real sudden like. They become the best of friends. But that's not how the story goes. No, that's uh, that's not how the story ends. Because the little wrinkle in Teddy's plan for that loose mare, the absence of a saddle, you can't just dally in midair. But now that mare's upon him, and a flash should be on by. So now or never, he figured, and he let his catch coin fly. And then his plan adjusted some. Because that horse sped up and run, and that's when Teddy realized his battle was just begun. <laughs> with no horn wraps to slow her down, he run with her best he could. <laughs> All the time he's a-thinking, another hand it sure be good. <laughs> that horse was building up some steam, they were covering lots of ground. Old Teddy had his hands full, but took time to look around, and he spots a lone white oak approaching. He figures that will slow her down. So seizing opportunity, he runs some dallies around. Oh. Well, now I've caught her, Teddy thought, with three dallies around that oak. <laughs> Breathed a big old sigh of relief. Detects a whiff of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Was an odor of some familiar, although not that of burning tree. And that's when Teddy realized, well, that burning smell is me. <laughs> Now he's around an oak tree. Teddy says he has now learned ain't near enough to stop a horse. Which is why his hand's now burning. <laughs> but rather than feeling defeated, Teddy takes it all in stride. He says, oh, it's just skin. A jump start. I'm callousing up his high. <laughs> but next time, Teddy says, if needing to stop a runaway hoss, next time, he'll be in a sack. And then we'll see who's boss. <laughs> Thank you. Not all um, cowboys are boys. There, uh, in fact, there, there once was a cowgirl from Nantucket. <laughs> who climbed on a bull and said, Buck it. She was dead set on eight when they swung open the gate, but that bull had a different agenda that was aimed at getting her up in. So it didn't take long for her plan to unwind. Barely two bucks in, she's three bucks behind. 
That big bull was laying a hurt, slinging a snot and kicking up dirt. But say what you will, no cowgirl or guy has ever shown more guts or tried. Which just made that bull perturbed. Actually more like disturbed. It dipped to the left, spun to the right all the time, bucking, bringing the fight, and a duck and a dime on a big belly roll. That big bucker was out of control. Well, the cowboys watching all brace for the rack. They're yelling, jump, girl, or you're dead as hell. Well, she just looked up, flashed her a grin. She says, don't worry, boys, I'm just breaking them in. <laughs> and with that, she buries her spurs in hide, centers up, and hangs on for more ride. Which made that bull be a nothing but rank, ramp up trying to buck off his flank. He sucked left with a sweeping fade, and those cowboys thought, sure, that girl's made. But she cowboyed up, got back in position, continued to ride, still set on her mission, determined to do all it take, and got the ride out and make the full eight. That cowgirl's taking a lick. But you know, the whole time she's riding, that clock's a ticket. And with the seconds about oh, 6.4, they saw something not seen before. She's fin in her hat and chump and spur, and that big bull settled. Just started to purr. <laughs> with a hoot and a holler, she looked around, swung her leg over, and jumped to the ground. Not a half tick later, that whistle blew eight, and that uncovered bull returned to the gate. Well, boy, she said, that there was fun. That was a bucking son of a gun. But why'd you jump off, they all wanted to know, because you had him beat, girl, you put on a show. Oh, you're right, boys, she said, I could have finished the ride. But I got to thinking, I might bruise your pride. <laughs> what with rough stock being a manly sport, not at all suited to us weaker sort. <laughs> you guys have uh, been a great attentive audience, and I appreciate that very much. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce my friends, Judy Coder and Jennifer Epps, who perform as the notable exceptions. They're coming to you from Ellensburg, Washington. They can tell you more about that. I will tell you that they have uh, been touring since October. Uh, non-stop and uh, from here they head up to Seattle and then back to back to Ellensburg after a big old big old tour in the western United States. They are um, phenomenally talented as you're going to discover here shortly. They are the Western Music Association best of the best harmony duo of the year and they've also been recognized as the Western Music, Music Association uh, harmony duo of the year and uh, you're going to love listening to my friends and soon to be yours, the notable exceptions. 